Welcome to the Into the Wilderness podcast. This is the final shows from Ewa, and they're cracking ones. We've had one of the guests on before, Davy Hughes, and he was on the episode, I can't remember the number, but it was the episode where Byron was in Sweden hunting moose, and there was a whole bunch of people around the table in a creaky old cabin, and everyone was sharing stories. Mm, it was... Uh, it was actually the first time I'd met uh, Davey, and it was an awesome and unforgettable trip. I've just finished writing up a, a series of articles in Sporting Rifle magazine, actually on the back of that, on the back of that trip, and we will be putting some more stuff on our blog about that and other things. Uh, which, since I've mentioned it uh, this early on in our intro, if you haven't read any of our blog, and there's a lot of really great conservation articles on there, then visit thepacebrothers.com, uh, hit blog, and you'll be able to find a whole bunch of content ready for uh, your consumption. Yep, and we also have Marcus from Garmin on, and we're going to be talking about a device which we've had multiple emails about and people coming up to us, uh, which is quite crazy because we only actually mentioned it very briefly on the the previous uh, podcast. Yeah, it was funny. I actually, we've been had two messages uh, about the safety device from Garmin. Um, as well as I got a phone call from uh, my cousin the other day, and he looks after a number of um, a number of estates up uh, up north in Scotland, and uh, he wanted a bit more info on it because he thought it would be a, a brilliant thing for uh, the people who work on the estate, the, the stalkers and foresters, to have as a safety device and an affordable one compared to uh, ones that they've actually. Uh, been looking at or have have used historically with quite high monthly charges for for this kind of safety device. So it was kind of a, a bit of a coincidence that we happened to talk about about it with Marcus in Germany a few weeks ago. It's the InReach handheld device. Now during the interview, we did actually have to cut just so there was no confusion. We cut a, a small uh, cut it. Uh, I cut a small amount of the talking out, which was talking about the price. So you hear us talk about the price range, and it's cut out it's just because uh, it was incorrect and we just didn't want people to get confused that's all so you have the prices so i actually have the prices here uh and you can go and check it out on the garmin website and i'm sure there's other retails around the uk and around the globe uh that you can get it from so basically this this garmin handheld device you hear all about it in the show uh but it it, like byron's saying a great safety device it ranges from 399 99 pounds to 499 no sorry yeah 400 and daryl can't actually read his yeah, own handwriting read, right? it's either 449.99 <laughs> or 499.99 so it's in that region uh and it basically has different maps on it depending on uh which one you buy and the monthly subscription plans range from 12.99 a month to 109.99 a month uh that's just due to uh the different features that you can get but I had a look, and even the twelve ninety nine a month gives you the unlimited SOS rescue, which is the sort of which the primary is probably function. why you'd be buying it in the first place. So there you go. You can apply those price ranges to the interview here. Is it uh, is Marcus second? Does he do? Yes, he is. Um, also, one other thing about that, we talk about the battery life. At the time, we didn't know how long the battery life lasted. This one is a bit of a, a vague one as well, only because it depends on how you use the device. So you can get 100 hours out of it, up to 30 days. And now the reason for that is because it depends on your GPS intervals. So you can set it for every two minutes, every 10 minutes, every 20 minutes, and so on and so on. Uh, so that's 100 hours use over 30 days. Yeah, but the, the 100 hours is the when the GPS is on pretty much all the time. Oh, okay. So, if, so you're, if you're smashing it, you'll get 100 hours out of it. Mm. Uh, but if you're using, I think it's the one where it's every 30 minutes, uh, it pings your location. Uh, it lasts 30 days. And if it's just off in your backpack, battery lasts three years. It's rechargeable lithium batteries. All right, so you can have it off until you need it. Yep. Amazing. Well, you'll hear far more about that when you get yep. to the interview with Marcus. Uh, we have the Northern Shooting Show coming up 
rather rapidly now. I'm just actually looking at the calendar. It's like three weeks away or something crazy like that. Uh, we've, uh, as we we said, I think from six months ago, it was going to be our first show of 2017 uh, because we weren't. We, we were well. We were, I suppose we. Were, it's the first show in the UK because we were in Ewa. Yeah. Uh, first show uh, in the UK. Uh, it's quite exciting for us because we're going to be sharing a stand with Sax. So there's going to be. Um, some bits and pieces going on, but importantly, we're going to be having two live debates. I'm not quite sure we've decided exactly what time during the day, but one on Saturday, one on Sunday. We're just assembling the panel. Who's going to be on it right now? It's uh, quite a. It's going to be an interesting array of people. Uh, and as soon as I have everybody confirmed, I will let our listeners l- uh, know. And the list of topics right now is probably longer than uh, we're actually going to be able to do, but. Uh, just looking at my notes here, we're going to look at um, foreign hunting and public opinion, uh, touch on land reform in Scotland, the use of technology such as thermal for recreational stalking, that's going to be an interesting one, generational disconnect with food, that's something we touch on quite a bit in the podcast, um, women in field sports, that's just a tiny selection, that's probably about a quarter of the list I've got in my, in my that, diary. That's here, enough so. to talk for about 10 hours. Yeah, exactly. Uh, also, at the Northern Shooting Show, it will be the first time you'll ever be able to see our film. Yes, that's really good. Uh, it's going to be premiering at 1 o'clock on Saturday. And then it's going to be on on Sunday as well, on the big screen in the main hall. Yep, that's it. So I think we, if there's anything else, we're going to... Is that all you done? Uh, I think I think that's it. I think that's everything that I wanted to say. Apart, oh, one last thing. And that is that uh, we have had quite a lot of people inquiring about our hunts. The first one in November is booked up. We have a full complement of people. And the next date is going to be January. Uh, I'm going to send an email out to everybody who's inquired uh, probably in the next week to two weeks with the January dates so if you want to make sure that you're on the list because basically it's first come first serves once we send out the dates uh, then make sure you, you email us visit thepacebrothers.com have a look at wilderness hunts and send us a, an email with the inquiry form and I'll add you to the list and then I'll send out all the dates to everybody at the same time we're not done at all competitions oh yes that <laughs> I can't believe <laughs> I nearly forgot, forgot that. that okay so uh, the previous week's um, competitions they failed miserably so and it I, it wasn't normally when we have competitions we have in the hundreds of entries and this is the first time ever we've had zero but we think it's partially due to Facebook because we got a message from someone the other day saying they couldn't leave a review and we checked it out and we think you can uh, I, I don't know what went. I really don't know what went wrong. Uh, something went wrong. So we're going to redo it and screw Facebook. We're not going to do um, reviews on that. What we're going to do is, if you have left money for the chimpanzee, or you can leave money for the chimpanzee, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, go and check out the Ivan Carter podcast. We're raising should say funds. Chim- should, we should say chimpanzees. Chimpanzees. <laughs> yeah, uh, we're raising money to feed and house a chimpanzee for an entire year. We have £210 to go. We do. So it's not a lot, £210. So amazing, everyone that's donated so far. So if you've donated so far, uh, then you're already in the prize draw. And if you'd like to be in the prize draw for a pair of shooting glasses and a pair of shooting ear defenders. Some, yeah, that's a Smith Optics um, shooting glasses, the ones that we had, take over, yeah. took over from two weeks ago, and a set of uh, Surefire passive ear defenders. Yeah, if you want them, then just donate. Or if you've already donated, you're already in the competition. Yeah, so a minimum of three pounds. So it's uh, it's, it's not, like a, not it's like a raffle almost now, it's, it's but you're helping kind of, out. Yeah, the the whole point is that it's going to a fantastic cause to help fund the chimpanzee uh, sanctuary over in the Congo. Uh, and we have another competition. We do. So that's our podcast competition yeah. out of the way. That's in the box enter. podcast competition. Second competition. And this is um, it's running on our website. It is, and it's uh, related to our guest. Who, after interviewing uh, Davy, he, he he pinged me a message and said, "Hey, how would you like to uh, give away one of our Swazi jackets um, <laughs> on the website or whatever?" I said, "That would be awesome. I'm sure people would love to win one. And I'm fortunate enough to to own one as well. And it is great kit. That was what everybody was wearing in the the Swedish trip that we were talking about at the start of our intro. So." It's going to run on our website, thepacebrothers.com, and it's very simple. All you have to do is subscribe. 
We don't bombard. I think we've probably only sent one email. Um, one. Lot and of it was for the up. chimpanzee. It was, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you're not going to see emails from us uh, a great deal, only when there's something important or genuinely interesting. So find at the bottom of the page, on any of the pages, just find the, the, the box that says subscribe, stick your email on there, and you'll be added to the subscribe list. And anyone in that subscribe list yeah, will a, be in the, for a shout. There's a few hundred of you, so yeah, so. already on it. So if you've uh, not subscribed, get in there and subscribe. And, and we're going to put up a, a little blog post about uh, Davey because uh, apart from being a guest on a podcast, he's just a pretty cool guy as well. And I'm, I'm looking forward to where we're actually going to, it's quite likely that we're going to be hunting with him in Scotland later on this year. So that's going to be super exciting. And we're going to try and do a, a podcast in the field with him. Okay. I think that's it. Don't forget that this podcast is uh, supported and brought to you by the Scottish Association for Country Sports. We are going to be with them as, uh, at the Northern Shooting Show, as I said. Right now, um, they've got some fantastic tie-in deals with a number of car manufacturers if, you, if you're if you a member of them, so that's maybe a little incentive. And I was actually just uh, shooting a, um, a SAX event this weekend just past, um, just a, a, shot, a shotgun day held down in the borders with, that was being run just to say uh, thanks to a number of people who, who support the organization. That was a, a really, really good day, and I think there'll be some pictures going up on, on Facebook and social media for that pretty soon. So, yeah, if you don't know about them, go check them out on their f- Facebook page. They um, they have supported us from day one, and it's important that we as hunters um, support our hunting organizations who in turn support us. Davey, thank you very much for joining us on the Into the Wilderness podcast. This is, of course, the second time that you've been on, although this is the first time you've been on by yourself. Uh, Davey Hughes of uh, Swazi Clothing. Thanks very much for coming on. Hey, thanks very much for inviting me. What a fair. Has it been good for you? It's been fantastic. I mean, when we when we came here, we had you know some targets that we wanted to hit, and we said, over the four days, this is what we want to do. Hmm. And by the first day, we'd reached those targets, and it was like, should we pack up and go home, <laughs> or Keep should we carry on. on? You know, It's like, oh, let's carry on. And it, it really, every single day has brought something different and something exciting. Mm. We were trying to we were explain with other guests that we had on to our listeners just how big this fair is. And when we took you over to the stand, you said, I've not even been in this hole yet. <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah. we haven't been to SHOT Show either. And when we were asking people that have, they were saying it's comparable to SHOT Show. Yeah. You've I've, done SHOT. Yeah, I've done SHOT quite a few years ago, but I would say it would be pretty comparable in size. Mm. Uh, here, there's so much quality. Mm. Yeah, I think Europe, for me, you know, and that's why we're been focusing on this European market because they actually get the quality end of, of the industry. Which of course is where, where your brand and where your clothing sits. It's at the top end of the, the quality spectrum. Oh, thanks for saying that. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to think it is. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. so it, it, it ties in nicely with the, the sort of the level of quality that we're seeing in a place like this. Yeah, it does. And certainly, you know, I mean, obviously we're seeing the retailers, mm. um, but we came last year to just research the market and we came to the Yachton Hoodens Mm. Uh, show up in Dortmund and so we spoke to the to the hunters because that's what we wanted to do first is actually go to the coalface and speak to those guys yeah. and from there we thought okay you know really good response let's go to Ewa now and start talking to the retailers mm. um, and we had so much information that we could take from that first show to this show and so it's really helped being able to talk to the retailers and say this is what your customers are saying mm. so and Swazi um, you know, we thought it would be a bit of an unknown, but the retailers all come up and say, heard about this brand, so mm. that's been a plus. Just backtrack just a minute and just give us a little bit of history behind, behind the company and where it's come from, because I mean, you're the man behind it, so it, it's, it, it's really nice to have somebody who was behind it from day one, it's your baby. Yeah, you Actually, do, you do, we don't get that too yeah, often. It's rare that you yeah. get to have that with regard to a product. Well, it's going to end one day, isn't it? You know, <laughs> I'll probably end up falling over a hill or something. <laughs> Um, you know, the, the journey's been 24 years, and my, my background prior to getting into the clothing industry was I was a, a trapper. So I'd spend sort of five or six months of every year in the hills trapping. And then the skin market crashed, and I I'd sort of understood that I'd become an expert at getting wet and cold. And so if I could start a business where I could keep people dry and warm, then that for me was, was you know, going to be exciting and so that's what I did and it was small a small start to the business obviously you know just I knew nothing about garments I knew nothing about patterns nothing about 
um, fabric. So it took a good year to learn all of that, and then all of a sudden, poof, it took off. Mm. Um, and it's been a hell of a journey, and what it's allowed me to do is to um, travel the world and meet other hunters. And I always want to be known as a hunter, not just uh, a corporate clothing manufacturer, you know? It's sort of, yeah, hunting's my life. Mm. Not, clothing is yeah. not my life. Mm. Hunting is my life. But it's nice seeing it from that perspective, though, because you started as the hunter, and then you created something to fit the hunter, rather than a clothing a clothing brand that is a clothing brand first and then has to find hunters to, to, to form it into something which is suitable. Yeah, and I guess we're driven by different reasons too. A lot of the clothing companies, you know, they're driven by profit or driven by whatever demands the shareholders make. Where for us, you know, we're driven by one thing and that's um, let's have a lot of fun, <laughs> you know. And a fun means that, you know, the guys in the, you know, because we make it all there in New Zealand still and so if the if sales manager comes in or if our um, cutting room production manager comes in and says, uh, look, it's a fantastic day, and I've heard a couple of stags roaring out the back of the farm. Do you mind very much if I take the rest of the day off? And it's like, go for it. You know, that's awesome. I want to come work for you. <laughs> New company policy. We need to change the way I that think we, we work. do. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's it. Let me get my notebook out. That's yeah, it. Definitely. It's going to be policy number one. We want to get you guys out to New Zealand. We, we've got to come at some uh, point. Well, Daryl's well, been I've not been, that long ago. But, uh, but not, uh, not hunting. I was, uh, the only thing I did, I was spearfishing and fishing, but no, oh, no wow. hunting. But I want to hunt. Yeah, it's uh, what a place. It, it's, it's always fascinated me, but it's, uh, obviously it's, it's, a lo- it's, a, it's a long way, but we, we must do it. Well, we there's a lot to do, and if you guys do come over... Uh, it'll be giving me a great excuse at work. You know, I've got to go out with these guys. <laughs> I've got to do it. So important that I go out. <laughs> you know, we'll be back in two weeks. Uh, yeah, yeah. See you later. But because you do so much hunting, this means that you basically test every piece of kit that you yeah that was actually prototypes my, and stuff like that. You are testing it yourself. What is your testing yeah. process? I mean, I think it's important for people to understand exactly how much work goes in in the background. Oh, let, let's take it, you know, point in case, this lightweight jacket yep. here, you know, it's just been released. This is the first time we've really shown it to anyone at, at, at the Ewa show is the grand release of this product. But, you know, for me, it's, it's not a new product because I've been living with it for two years mm. and developing it, you know, developing the fabrics, moving, moving from what it was initially um, to a fabric which has actually got a stretch to it. And it's a mechanical stretch, the way we make the fabric. Um, it's 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 my baby, mm-hmm. and it's something that for two years I've sort of brought through, tested, not been happy with it, changed the fabric, changed the designs, taken it back out, given it another hiding, lived in it for you know a week, and then gone okay, let's take this to market. We're ready, but that process has taken two years. Amazing. So so what was what what was it that prompted you to think I need to design this? Um, well, to be honest, um, I, I've been wearing a, a, a jacket that I made very similar to this for the last 15 years. And what prompted me to go into production with this particular item was I was standing on a hill, the weather was atrocious, you know, 150 kilometre winds, hail, rain, and I thought, man, this jacket's really cool. And then the penny dropped, it's like, well, why don't you sell them? <laughs> <laughs> So, like, so you made the jacket for yourself. <laughs> yourself. Yeah, because you know I, I was doing adventure um, racing, mm. and so I wanted an ultralight jacket that I could um, uh, mountain run in, that I could kayak in and cycle in. And so I made myself this gear 15 years ago. <laughs> That's awesome. And I'm standing on this hill, you know, just just two years ago, and I thought it's still going really strong. You know, it's mm. lasted me sort of 13, 14 years, and it's still going. Let's sell them. That's a good idea. Yeah, no, yeah, definitely. I know, so I, know. I mean, this is slow. really, really light. This. So well, uh, you told us yesterday. I can't remember what you said. It <coughs> it's weighs two hundred and ninety grams. Mm. Or, I mean, it falls up into something into the hood. Yeah, yeah. Um, we could make it lighter, but then it, it's going to be a compromise between being ultra, ultra light and its durability. So you have to draw a line somewhere and say, look, this is light as we want to make it and still maintain a semblance of you know good, tough durability. Mm-hmm. So. And it serves a different function to the other, uh, your other garments, which are, do have that, that heavier material. Yeah, they're heavier. I mean, you know, when you wear a lighter garment, you'll get colder in it. There's, mm. there's no two ways around it because, you know, as the rain falls on you and, and starts to push a light garment to you, you've got conductive heat loss and it's, it's almost like it's sticking to you because it's so ultra light. 
Um, whereas a heavier garment, you've got a little bit more loft to it, a little bit more insulation, so you stay, you actually stay warmer in it. Mm -hmm. So that's the trade-off that you've got to make as well. And hunters need to understand, you know, I wear this garment for that particular reason. For myself, I love this garment in the Alpine. Yeah. Um, when you when you know that you've got to push yourself up yeah, the mountains. Yeah. And so you can you can strip it off, um, you know, tie it around your waist until you actually need it. As long as you take good insulation with a garment like this, you'll be fine because it's the wind. That you, and, you know, yeah, we you, know all about yeah. that. You know, so, so many people say, "Oh, you know, I want a garment that's going to keep me 100% dry." It was like it's just not possible. Hunters hunt with their hoods down. Hunters sweat, you know, profusely when they're climbing high mountains. Oh, tell me, tell me about <laughs> it. I am, I'm He's probably a sweating one machine. Of the, this guy, the worst people <laughs> sweating. So normally when I I go up, I have to take a spare T-shirt with me because I sweat that much. I'm just dripping when I get to the top. I don't even understand. He's just little, two little sweat patches and there's me absolutely soaking. But that was the one thing that I learned from you when, I mean, the last time I saw you, we were, we were in Sweden, was this acknowledgement that you know, you're going to get wet. Mm. But yeah. you just have to embrace it and carry the right clothes so that one, you, you can wick it away, one, you, you, two, you can dry it, and then you've got something else that you can put on that's going to keep you dry from the rain. Yeah, and so, you know, it's not about being wet and dry, it's all about being comfortable. Yeah. You know, and you and I know that because we had some uncomfortable nights. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a cold. I think, um, yeah, you've just got to get that, that whole thought of garments are their, their tools, their instruments. Mm. And if you get wet, that's fine. They will work. They will dry you. Mm. Uh, and you will be comfortable. Now, you're, you're big into the, the, the fleece layers. Uh, I've... Daryl and I have both worn merino. I know that you, you'll, you'll, you'll talk about uh, merino probably off the back of this question, but a lot of people probably don't wear fleece as much as they probably should. I mean, what's your take on that and, and um, where you should and shouldn't use it? I mean, for me, I, I come from the home of merino, you know. Mm. New Zealand, we've got so many million merino on, on the hill, and my, my neighbours are merino farmers, so they probably don't want to hear me say this. But <laughs> uh, I think it's a fantastic fibre. I think they make amazing garments for me, I love to travel in them. I love the leisure side of merino. But as far as recreation, as far as being on the side of the hill, I, I want a garment that's going to dry quickly. And that's the thing with merino. It's fantastic at absorbing moisture and, and smells. Mm. Um, but it's not so good at releasing that moisture. And so it stays wet and it stays cold in my mind. Whereas fleece, you can actually watch it work. You can you watch can. it You can, you actually can, yeah. And, and wick the sweat away. From yeah. yeah. So that, that's proof enough for me. Mm. And being warm. And we come to shows like this and, and, you know, the bigger shows we might have a dozen staff. Mm. And so we have these lovely merino um, shirts that they all wear, they're all embroidered with swazi on. And when it's cold in the morning, they come and see me and they say, do you mind very much if I put a fleece underneath this merino? <laughs> so, and that's, that's Speaks proof. for itself. Yeah, it does. But I, th I think that's the problem with... Uh, a lot of people in their clothing, they don't quite understand how it works. Yeah, layering is a big thing, you know, and you, you were talking about T-shirts before. Hopefully you mean thermal T-shirts. Yeah, yeah, cotton yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, but you'd be surprised how many guys still wear cotton T-shirts. Mm. And then they get drenched and then they get cold and they start to complain. They say, oh, bloody rain jacket doesn't keep me warm. It's like, well, what are you wearing underneath it? Yeah. Um, cotton so T-shirts, not for the mountains. No, not for the mountains. So, you know, a good... Thermal uh, regulator, something, you know, I, lo I love the micro fleece, always been a huge fan of it. You know, keep that microclimate, you know, next to your skin, constant, around about 34 degrees. Uh, and then mid layers to give you that extra insulation because it's actually not fibres that keep you warm, it's the air that they trap. Yeah. So all you're talking about is how am I going to trap air and how am I going to get moisture away from that trapped air. Mm. Um, and then once you've got the mid layers, you're out of shells. And whether that's a, a rain shell or a windproof shell, so important. Keep the wind chill factor down. Mm. Yeah, well, we saw it recently when we, we yeah. were filming up on top, the top of a mountain six weeks ago or something yeah. in Scotland. And it was bloody cold up there. But actually most of it was the wind. Yeah, it was the wind. Because that, as that soon as you... you I was wearing your um, uh, Swazi mitts. Oh, yeah. And as soon as you took them off, you had a minute and you couldn't use your hands anymore. But that wind barrier, amazing. 
Hey, um, we haven't come up with a name for those yet. You're one of the test pilots, by the way. Oh. I, didn't, I didn't tell you about that, did I? <laughs> um, well, when, when eventually you do release, so I'll, I'll have to think. But then, yeah, yeah. Yeah. For, the, for the rest of the world who, haven't, who are not going to be able to buy them yet, they're awesome. <laughs> oh, good, good. Well, keep, uh, and again, you know, I guess it's, what, six months since? Yeah, since about that, yeah. yeah. In another six months' time, you and I will sit down and we'll say, okay, how did they perform? Mm. I, I just really don't want to put gear into the market unless I've got a lot of hardcore guys who have tested it and said, this works. Mm. And, uh, you know, innovation isn't always, you know, the Big Bang Theory. Innovation could be small, incremental changes to a product over, over its life, um, lifetime. That's innovation, you know, keep on doing things. Or a, a new fabric comes along, you know, well, perhaps it is a Big Bang Theory, you know. Yeah. When Gore-Tex first hit the market, it was like, it was huge, wow, it? it's monstrous. It took a while for them to figure out they needed to seal the seams as yeah. well. You know? <laughs> um, no, it, it is key that, and you know, we see it, so I don't know, forget about clothing, but just generally speaking, and it doesn't even have to be within the shooting world, when products, you see products come to market, and I, we often mm. ask ourselves the question, Daryl and I, it's like, did anyone actually test did, this? Like for any period, even cars, it's, you ask yourself, did anyone drive this maybe, you know, to maybe 150,000 miles before they gave it to the public? Made, no, ma- I think made by someone <laughs> in an office that doesn't leave the office. Yeah. Yeah. It uh, happens all yeah. the time. Yeah. yeah. Oh, everywhere. Designers, yeah. you see. Mm. It's like when you go to airports, they're designed by people who catch trains, <laughs> <laughs> not fly. Yeah, I, I try to avoid spending too much time in airports if I can, but it's uh, unfortunately unavoidable <laughs> when you do as much travelling as we do. International hunters. Mm. <laughs> you have no choice unless yeah. you're crazy and drive to Norway like we did from yeah. Scotland. <laughs> hey, international hunting, it's, it's become a bit of a chore sometimes to mm, actually sometime. fly with a firearm. Some, oh, Some places God. have got Flying with right. a firearm, yeah, yeah, yeah. man. What's yeah. it like flying into New Zealand with a firearm? Easy? Easy. Yeah. yeah. I would have thought so. Um, I mean, I hunt all over the world and I've hunted in some pretty out of the way places worst country in the world to take a firearm into Australia yeah yeah uh, worst country to get a firearm out of Australia um, <laughs> I see a theme here <laughs> <laughs> no they just they just need to chill out a wee bit you know uh, I do remember once sitting on an aeroplane I was I was flying from Heathrow to Istanbul and looking out of the window and seeing on the the, the tarmac my rifle case yeah. And going, that's my rifle. I'm on the plane. What the hell is it doing there? So, oh, and it that, wasn't going on your plane. It wasn't going that's on the plane. Oh, it's like, whoa. And there's really? nothing you can do yeah. about it. Well, there was actually. Oh. I, I ran up the front, which caused really? a bit of a stir. Um, they they called the um, the guys in a Heathrow. A woman came tearing out onto the tarmac, grabbed it, and came. And then they brought some steps over, and she brought it up onto the plane. And she said, you know, is this what we're talking about? I said, absolutely. It's sitting on the tarmac. We went back down to the tarmac. She said, need to open it up. I opened it up. And she said, this is your rifle. I said, this is my rifle. She said, I'll arrange for it to be on the plane, sir. That's amazing. Thank God. That is amazing. What yeah. luck. Yeah. And I'm amazed. Was this before the days where they, they locked the cockpit and everything? Uh, well, I didn't go into the cockpit. I just no, went up to the stewardess at the front. This was three years ago. Oh, okay. So oh, it wasn't yeah. that long ago. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well. Cool story. Yeah. Yeah. So at least your rifle arrived when you did. Yeah, but Australia does have some uh, strange uh, rules. I mean, if you've got a crumb in your beard, they they get a bit upset. Yeah, they're a little bit anal, you know. <laughs> sort of, I think. Um, yeah, I'm not having a, a go at the no. We got cousins. Uh, and stuff uh, in I, lived, I lived there for a year as well, so I I, <laughs> so I, 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 I love I love it over yeah, there. Let so. me tell you, mate. <laughs> uh, no, they're great. I love hunting there. You know, I've got so many good hunting buddies in Aussie, so I go there a lot. Yeah. So I know all of their rules, and I know there's nine pages of you know, uh, forms to fill in to get my rifle in, but it's well worth it. Mm. Um, but they just, they, they do, they have to chill out. They're a very urbanised country, of course. Yeah. You know, what, what do you, what's your favourite thing to hunt in Australia? Uh, favourite thing to hunt? Um, mm, I, lo- I love hunting chittle um, because it's such a, a cool looking deer. Samba is always a challenge and mm. Samba in, in um, Victoria, you know, in, in midwinter, you know, stalking not not with the hounds, but actually stalking, is one of one of the hardest hunts you'll ever do. You know, they're just such a weary animal, and you know, to go and do those hunts with, with good mates, yeah, it's not always successful, but you know, mm. the hunting is always amazing. Well, yeah. we, when we did the interview with uh, Ulrich, yeah, he'd he had been hunting uh, Samba, Samba there with a pro. And yeah, I mean, it's, he's actually he videoed the whole thing. It's online. Yeah, what an amazing, 
Yeah. And it, it was it was that particular hunt where he he shot this uh, large stag and he realized that he'd done it and he'd been out for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks by himself a lot of it and he just like in floods of tears he was just so emotional because he'd been wanting to do it for so long but yeah it looks like it looks like an amazing place to truly hunt yeah yeah what about water buffalo have you ever done water buffalo? yeah i've hunted water buffalo four or five times actually mm. um pretty exciting uh, really really hard to put down mm. you know um although you know you can shoot them with a 270 if you want mm. um <laughs> And I've hunted Cape quite a number of times, Cape buffalo. So people have often asked me, you know, what's the comparison? What's the comparison? Mm. And uh, Cape buffalo is a dangerous son of a bitch. Yeah, yeah. You know, that and for me, that's what I love hunting more than anything. Cape buffalo. Really? That's, yeah. That's it. That's it. That's number one. Um, water buffalo. I don't think I'll ever hunt another water buffalo. You've done it. You know, I've, I've done it, and it, it just doesn't have the same, you know, intensity as as Cape Buffalo. Mm. Harder to kill, but um, I don't think they're anywhere near as aggressive or, yeah. So what's what's in store for you this year? Have you got anything, uh, any amazing trip lined up? Oh, or not you for be a couple of weeks. Um, yeah, sort of, I'm off to Kodiak Island um, next month, end of next month, on a brown bear hunt, spring uh, brown bear on Kodiak. Um, I love Kodiak Island. I've hunted there a number of times. Never hunted bear there, so... Mm. Can't wait to go back. That'll be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I know, I've never been there, but I've yeah. I've read loads of you know about the hunting there, and I've read stories of people who have taken bear there, and it, yeah, it seems like uh, it's other side of the world, and it's completely different to anything I've done. Yeah, and I got a new rifle. That's always a lot of fun, you know. So that your excuse for going? Yeah, 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 that's it. I rifle. had to work up a load, and you know, sort of, oh, you know, what grain projectile, what sort of bullet should I use, you know. So what, you might as well tell us, what, what, what are you shooting and what are you using? There uh, I'm going to take a um, 416 Rigby, mm -hmm. and it's an actual Rigby, John Rigby. Yep. Uh, big game. Um, I'll be, I'll be um, using 340 grain um, Woodleys, mm -hmm. um, or, which was a close call. I was going to use the, um, the Hornadies or the Woodleys, and just so happened that I had a couple of boxes of Woodleys, mm. so that's what I'm using. Mm. Um, and then... Uh, I've got one of the Leica Magnus scopes on top of on top of that. Really nice little scope. Love yeah. that. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. You sounds, know, sounds new pairs of boots, new new pair of boots, new socks, new undies. <laughs> Anything else you want to know? <laughs> no, that's great. I'm sure that you can have an, an absolute blast, and uh, yeah. I'll be looking forward to the the pictures and report back when you get back from Kodiak. Cool. And I do I do want to um, come back to Europe and hunt later in the year. Mm. And I'd I mean, I love hunting in Scotland. Mm. It's, I don't know, it's just, it's going home, isn't it? You yeah. Know? Hunting red deer in Scotland is, that's it. It's, it's the pinnacle. Yeah, there, there's something about it. You know, it's, it's, it's very available, yeah. but there's still something, oh, still something God. about it. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about <laughs> it. But it makes me weep almost, yeah. you know, to go there. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe maybe, maybe when we come to New Zealand, we can hunt with you, and then you come to Scotland, yeah. and you can we you hunt with us when we done, done. Sounds like a deal. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Davy, thank you very much for joining us on the podcast today. It's been great to speak to you as always, and uh, I'm sure it probably it won't be too long before we bump into each other again. Thanks very much. It's been a real pleasure, guys. Marcus, thank you very much for joining us on the Into the Wilderness podcast. Uh, you have uh, recently, we've seen a, a bit of a, an association between Vaughan, we're on the Vaughan stand and Garmin, but, and we're going to talk about that in a bit. But before we start with that, what is, what is the latest thing that you guys have released? Yeah, Thirst, thank you for having me here. A pleasure. Yeah. Um, the latest thing for us is actually the, the, the connected hunter, hmm. the modern hunter from a connected perspective. We see a, a lot of products are coming out on the market from different vendors, but we see a lack of a total ecosystem. Mm -hmm. That's my part. And uh, I have the, the big privilege of working for Garmin, who has products in many, many uh, different segments. And for starters, we have the, uh, the Action Watch, as we call it. Yep. It's, it's a smart watch. It's a Phoenix 3, and the Phoenix 5 is coming out any day, any day now. And you can see the dog, you can see your heartbeat, and you can see your position. And then you can translate, yeah, the information from the, uh, the, the, the Alpha 100, which is a dog tracker system. And you can see that in your watch. So, so this has got the built-in heart rate monitor? Correct. Ah, very yeah. nice. So, so uh, y just, just not the outdoor experience. You also, also get the physical yeah. uh, tracking and you can also monitor your, uh, your physical well-being. Yeah. 
we also of course have a weight scale and index scale to if you want to get real hardcore <laughs> but that's nothing to you should drag out in the in the wilderness yeah and so i mean just using that as an example how would that work so this is the the dog tracking system yeah, yeah. 100 and it, it's connected to your watch so how Correct. would that work if you've got your dog out and what, what how would you uh, use the technology to yeah. its uh, optimum if you like if, if you're a, if you're a, a, a a dog person or, or a dog hunter, so you, you, you uh, have, have the dog and you manage the dog in the hunting, yeah. you use it quite a lot. Mm -hmm. So you, you see the dog, you see the uh, map, you see the, the uh, breadcrumbs where you've gone and so yeah. on, and you can also make position, here we shot the deer or here we shot the wild boar. Um, but if you have your hands full, and this is just hanging on the, uh, on, on the vest, mm -hmm. and you're keeping the dog, you have your, your, uh, your, your, your gun, you can actually see the direction of up to three dogs at the same time, and the yards or meters on your away watch. from you, yeah, all on your watch. Yeah, so you see that direction. Is mm. it uh, coming to me or going away? And you see the yards or meters. Amazing. So when I, when I'm sitting on a tree, tree stand, I just connect the uh, items. I just hang this in a tree. Mm -hmm. I don't want to uh, look too much at it when when I'm sitting at the tree stand. Mm -hmm. And then I only look at the watch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then when I see, uh, oh, it's coming towards me, 400 meters. 300 meters, wow, now the game is, is coming close. Yeah. Then I can get, get eager, and then when I see, okay, 600, 8, 900, then I can relax. And, and another benefit, of course, you will get smart messages. Yeah. You shouldn't be on your Facebook too much, and you shouldn't go on Wikipedia or looking up uh, trees and stuff. You want to try and stay focused. The job try at hand, and stay which focused. Is being hunting, which is, uh, you, I mean, you're absolutely right. It, it is. It's a shame almost in the, in the sort of modern world that we have. We go hunting because of, uh, we have this discussion on the podcast all the time. There's a whole array of reasons we go hunting, but it is quite easy to get distracted yeah, with the things which are actually not even important. That's the, nothing to do with why you're out there. Uh, and, and you are right. You take out your phone because you want to maybe take a picture and then yeah. it's the next thing. You've got a few messages. and Yeah, and then you have Facebook there, right? And then Twitter and what did Jan said. And then you're, then you're off, right? Mm -hmm. And you, when you're in the wilderness or, or hunting, stay focused on the task at hand. So hunt. you're basically filtering it through your watch. Yeah. Okay, um, the, the wife is calling. That could be important. I'll pick up Yeah, children, uh, maybe the boss. Um, and then otherwise, no. And you can, as you know, depending on what mode of yeah. phone you have, you can have a filter already in it, so you yeah. don't don't uh, take through notifications. But from my yeah. perspective, who has two small children at home, I, I like to be be um, available for for the missus mm -hmm. and to give her the safety. Yeah. Otherwise, good. If not problem, don't call. But if you call, there is a problem, yeah. and then I want to be reachable. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so so for me, it's a filter. Yeah. Mm. So you don't put up the phone. Yeah. Yes. So uh, we uh, how. Ha have, do you view that hunting has changed over you know mm -hmm. a period of, of decades? You know, if we look back 30 years, things seemed a little bit more simple. You know, there wasn't as much kit, there wasn't as many things as you had to pack, uh, and some would say as we moved to where we are today, people are taking too much stuff with them. Mm -hmm. But there are things which are making life safer and and better and, and more efficient. So how, how do you see that change and the way that Garmin fit into that with your product? Uh, yeah, I, I did get a, quite a lot of thoughts on that one. If you go back 150 years, m many people were, you, when you have the musketeer and such, the, the development were from, from uh, muscle loading to, to paper and linen cartridges. Mm -hmm. So you didn't, you didn't yeah. have a, a metal. And that step was, I'm sure many people said, oh, what's that <laughs> new idea? Why should you do that? And then you move to, to the, uh, fr from the uh, pocket watch to the wrist watch. Mm -hmm. And that was actually due in the First World War because you needed two hands yeah. when you did the fighting. So yeah. the officers did, did move away from the pocket watch to the wristwatch. A little less time uh, yeah. in previous wars. You, know, you, don't, you didn't have time during World War I to, <laughs> to flick out your now pocket watch. Now you know. Exactly. <laughs> now it was two hands, right? Yeah. You have to open up and up. And then you had the hunting radio. Mm -hmm. it, was, mm -hmm. it was it was a mar marvelous step to communicate in the woods. And many pe I'm sure many people said, what, should we talk all the day? Is, is that is that the scope here? Now we should hunting, and now no one can think of hunting without the radio, right? And then the, when I started hunting in the 80s, the the, the only uh, scope were a uh, uh, four magnes, uh, mag magnifier, fixed power. Yeah, yeah. fixed four. Yeah, yeah. And and uh, when I asked my dad, shouldn't we get a get a zoom in this one? No, you shouldn't <laughs> play or play along uh, around the scope all day. You should look at the game, look at the woods. And no one, I don't think they sell. Not, it's not very the, hard to find a fixed. Very hard and it's expensive, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, then the dog tracker when that came, it was a business business, and now that's. That, that, I mean, that everybody puts yeah, trackers not, on the yeah. dog. Yeah, and it's a safety issue, right? Mm. Because you want to keep track of where the dog is. Yeah. 
and we're lifting it one step more because we also have track where your partner is, mm -hmm. where the entire hunting team. So when you're getting out and hunting, you can actually see where your tree stand is, you can follow it on the map, and the, and the hunt team hunting master can actually see if you're in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. So from my perspective, I think it's more gadget, yes, but, but right used is safety, yeah, and okay. it's more safety. But that's always the the, the dog. The dog aspect is something yeah. you don't really see a huge amount in the UK. Massive in Europe. Massive in Europe, yeah. but would be extraordinarily use, useful because, um, especially during our hunting season, I know every two weeks there's my dogs missing on the hills, um, especially with the grouse shooting. They go mm. down in the ditches. I was looking for a dog last year, mm. and still it was never found, mm. and it's gone on the hill somewhere, and, yeah. and they don't know where it is. And b b back to the driving experience, uh, as one of our first product in Garmin was actually a PND, personal navigation device. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You, can, you can also see, if you have the Alpha 100, the dog in the personal navigation device. So oh, when you're okay. driving so around at night, uh, yeah, it's connected. Uh, right. When you're looking at the dog at night, you don't have to, to, to drive and put down and, and look, look at, look, look so at the Alpha. So you can see where, yeah, so where it's missing. Yeah. You can see where the location is. So you can is. drive around the location. That's yes, and brilliant. you see it directly in the, in the display. Uh, we also have a back camera on, on the back of the truck where you film the dog and you can see that also when you have arrived it and fetched it and when yeah. you have it in its, its, uh, its cage, mm. so you can see it's safe. For, for Garmin it's all about safety and we're trying to use, yes, a lot of equipment, but actually to increase safety. Okay. It's not like some of this is bulky though, it's, it's actually <laughs> it's very small streamlined. and streamlined. Yeah, and it's endurance, right? Yeah. We come from a, from, from a history so of a military... Waterproof a, impact. Yeah, and, and uh, history of military, and uh, the, as a developer, and uh, as a plus uh, the delivery to, to military, and it's have to be endurance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and what about uh, we were talking just before we came uh, on air for the podcast? You were talking about this device here, which is, uh, well, ultimately a personal safety device. Yeah. Just uh, talk me through a little bit about this because I could see when we were talking earlier some really solid applications even back in the UK. The UK definitely. Yeah. I uh, think there would be people interested, and also the price range. Very surprised at the price range this yeah. comes mm -hmm. in at. Yeah, this is this is actually a, a, a company that Barmy bought some uh, one, one year ago, and uh, in reach. So this is a satellite navigation and map device, and the, that's been the navigation device before with maps. Yep. And, and, and so it, lo it looks a bit like right. your traditional GPS, yeah, correct, handheld correct. GPS. But actually, that, that's the giveaway. Yeah. Because this is a satellite SOS button. Yep. So whenever you are, you don't have to. It don't work of the mobile networks. You don't have to think you have to be within the safety of the cell phone, because this works in the in the high Alps, in the northern Nordic, and as you said, the north of Scotland and mm. and, uh, yeah. and so on, right? And when you push it, it goes locally to the local search and rescue, or, or whatever that um, area of yeah. uh, of the search search is. Yeah, I mean, I can. I know just from some of the estates that we go and hunt on, even the stuff that we do ourselves. Yeah. It would have been nice actually to have something like this with you because you know, we're pushing the boundaries sometimes of probably going some places in some conditions that maybe is questionable whether you should be going. And that's not yeah. to encourage people to do that something that you shouldn't be doing as in you know, uh, take, uh, yeah, yeah, but big risk. Have, but. Having this there means that could be the difference between you being found and yeah. you never being found. Yeah. I mean, I mean you've you got to look at the times anyway as it is. You go out on the hills in some parts of Scotland. I mean, there's other parts of the world that are a lot more remote than Scotland. Yeah, yeah. Um, but still, in Scotland, it could be an hour, two hours before someone finds you, and the search and rescue could take another few hours. By that time in winter, exposure lucky, yeah. will get you. Yeah, and that's given that you have cellular yeah, 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 yeah. coverage, right? Yeah. And, and uh, we actually uh, did find out that the, the park rangers in, in Africa, Congo, yeah. uh, who's actually uh, working against poachers. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. They are still. They are already using our equipment. Oh, really? So it's actually tested by fire or tested mm. in in the real mm. world by, by real. And we're not sponsoring them. They, they, they buy them from from Thork mm. because they can't find anything better. Yeah, better from, than and, and for me, that's the the highest quality mark, right? Mm. If if the pros are using it in actually a kind of of, of war zone, it's which an is an unforgivable place. We in were the Congo. Yeah. We were just interviewing somebody last week, yeah. uh, Ivan Carter, who's been doing some work in the Congo yeah. with yeah. a lot of these anti-poaching yeah. groups. So they're, they're pro it's probably the same people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, that for, this is trustworthy all, all, all over again, durable, so it's working, and a price range that actually is depending on one third or so from, from a regular set phone. Yeah, well, yeah. and also you look at your price of your life. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's the thing, and, and yeah. because it is such a low price, it, 
why why not? Why would you, yeah, risk yeah, it, right? Yeah, and you can it, share yeah. it. You can you can share it if, if you're yeah. a team, if you're a mountain a group. What, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You could what, do, yeah. What's the battery life on something like this? Uh, I have to check that up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I'm not I'm we not can. an engineer. Yeah, I know it's fine. Uh, I'm, uh, so, it's so, just I'm always interested in battery life because that's the one thing with all these yeah, gadgets. Yeah. It normally is the downfall of them Correct. is the battery yeah. life of them and, the, uh, the watches the G the, I know because I've used a few GPS when I was in the military yeah. we, we had Garmin ones yeah. and uh, we actually used the incredible thing you bet you never used you knew never thought your GPS was being used for this we had a Garmin GPS that we used for mine hunting so we'd be given positions ah. uh, we would find the mines on the seabed we're using the the warship and then it would give us our exact GPS and then the divers would go out we'd go out on the dive boat with the Garmin GPS and then we would sit over the top of it um, and it was accurate within about less than half a meter which is more accurate than any other system that we had at the time and that's why we started using a handheld GPS. I didn't even know that story. No, yeah, it was actually, <laughs> like it, it, was, um, it wasn't even the military that thought of this, it was our, our dive team leader, the, uh, the PO in charge, yeah. and he thought, well, there's actually better stuff out there and he bought it himself and he bought all of the sea charts and the maps to overlay yeah, over yeah. the top of it and that's how we did our mine hunting. But you never knew that. <laughs> no, I never knew that. And yeah. that's actually the, f the fun scope of go going, yeah. in, going into Garmin and working for Garmin because you hear stories all the time yeah. because we've been so, so uh, luckily to, to be a supplier for the military mm. and uh, some stories are not allowed to tell and some, yeah. some are. And mm. it's, it's fun meeting people because many, many, many people have a very positive attitude and experience of, of, mm. uh, of Garmin products. Um, and, and uh, having said that, that that's, that's how I see the modern concept of hunting. And, and as sitting in, in the warm booth, we, we, we like to endorse the warm because they have a new way of thinking of packing. Mm, yeah, I was going to yeah. ask you about that. So yeah. the, the, the brand, other brands that you associate with and connect with, I guess, have to follow that same sort of ethos of, of yeah. what you, you want to show. Yeah, we, we have uh, durability, invention, High service and quality. Yeah, yeah many have that, right? But we, we've been proven by fire, as I said, many, many times. And, and speaking about it, it's, it's, it's a smart new invention. It's perfect fitable, it's durable. And as, as, as we see it, it's perfect. And it could work yeah. and should work with Garmin. Yeah. So, so uh, for, from my perspective, I think it's a perfect match. Mm. And we're very happy to be here and, and endorse Warren. I was just going to say before we went on that this is actually also incredibly light. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't weigh a great deal, which is a big consideration actually, yeah, you know, especially for us <laughs> carrying a lot of weight. And we also have that, right? Because weight durability, and then we have the battery. Mm. So, so people are asking us, why don't you have a touchscreen on the watch? Yeah, because Choose then you don't, it, it don't last a week. Yeah. Mm. So, and that's actually is the payoff, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we have we have many people mailing, and couldn't you have this? Couldn't you have that? Yeah, maybe. Maybe you we could, could have. But you do have to stop somewhere yes. sometimes. Yes, and we also have durability and battery life as a first focus yeah. because the pro users are more interesting in battery than features mm. down to below if it's an mp3 player or whatever yeah yeah, yeah. well and also when your life comes Depends down to on it, it then you need that reliability you need actually what yeah. it's made for exactly and, yeah, also and function, you have, you have yeah. to trust it right mm. and i'm assuming because of the nature of where these end up cold weather and stuff like yeah. that all tested for which um phones being a big one if you're yes. relying on your phone my iphone oh, man. uh if i'm in a cold temperature which is not cold for scandinavian standards no, uh, you're only talking minus three minus four yeah. um it will be dead within 30 minutes of using it correct. outside mm. and if you're yeah, relying so on that good point actually uh, you I can't mean, really rely on your you, phone you cannot rely on yeah. our mountain rescue at home um the amount of times in fact it's still going on now they've said to people do not rely on your phone as a gps going up the mountain because you will get lost either take a map with you, a paper map, yeah, correct. or a yeah. proper GPS. Yes. <laughs> no, and th th there you have it, right? And, and the, best, the best advertiser for commercial is that the, the users are telling about it. Yeah. Mm. Of course, right. So, so that, that's, the, that's the scoop for me. Brilliant. No, it's, uh, it, it's, it's cool to get your hands on technology like this, and it's amazing what it can do. It's amazing yeah. how far it's moved. Yeah. And you know, ultimately, it's about functionality. And it's about safety as well, and yeah. you know that that is really important. I think it's probably something a lot of people don't think about enough: is your own safety yeah, when you're you're out doing things, especially if you're doing something a little bit more sort of on the on the extreme and on the edge, which which more and more hunters and yeah. fishers are yeah. doing these days. Yeah, and as, as I don't think you should think you you don't have you shouldn't have to think so much about the equipment. It should just work. Hmm. It's the same on on a good backpack. It should be durable. It should, it should just yeah, work. You shouldn't it? think, should it, good, it's going to hold today? Yeah. Is the rifle going to fall out today? Mm. 
you shouldn't even have to think that thought. No. And it's same with the equipment. Is this going to hold today? Yes, of course it is, because it's a Garmin or it's a Dvorak. Does does what it says on the tin. Yeah, you can trustworthy. Yeah, Brilliant. and with good instructions. <laughs> good instructions, good manual, and uh, the, the oh, that is important. That, no, yes, that, yes, yes, yes. That is so important. And maybe that's our challenge, right? We have yeah. we have very complex products. Mm, yeah, you yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. May, maybe uh, yeah. The one thing I always look for is instructional videos online or yeah. someone doing yeah. it because the, generally, yeah, an instruction manuals only so good. But if you've got someone going to use this feature, this, this, and this, and you go, yeah. oh, okay, that's yeah. actually quite simple. Yeah, and I have YouTube, right? Yeah. yeah. And lucky to say, we're a big brand, so many people is actually doing this for us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, we have our own also, of course. Yeah. yeah. Marcus, it's been fascinating speaking to you. It's, thank you. Uh, My been pleasure. incredibly interesting. Yeah. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. So, thank you. And that is it for another two weeks. Um, as we said at the start, that was our last show uh, recorded in Germany at the Iwa Outdoor Classic. So we've got a whole bunch of new guests coming up. Uh, none of which have been recorded yet, but we will be recording them uh, very soon. I've got Donald Barry up at um, near Loch Sock, which is part of the Hutton, James Hutton Institute, which is very close to where we live. Uh, it's going to be an interesting discussion about land management and, and principles with farming and shooting and how that ties in and the best use of land. Uh, that's going to be quite good because we're actually going to travel up to Loch Sock to do it as opposed to doing it in our studio. So we're going to be face to face with him and maybe have a little bit of a walk around as well. Uh, I've got Louis, uh, Louise Gray uh, coming on and we mentioned her some months back but it's just uh, taken a bit of time to organise um, a date that was convenient for both of us and she is the author of a book, The Ethical Carnival. Um, I am pretty much finished the book, it's a good read and we're definitely going to talk about that and sort of how her view on uh, food and food ethics has changed as a result of that. And I'm also going to be, um, I'm not quite sure what the, the output from this podcast wise is going to be yet, but I am over in Switzerland at the end of this month at the start of the CIC International Conference. And there's going to be a gathering of journalists there basically to talk about um, hunting, hunters and our perception in the sort of the wider public and what we can do to help spread the correct kind of messages that we need to be telling. So that's That'll good. Be an interesting it's one. going to be very interesting. So hopefully I'll get uh, a lot of really great brains around the table and record a podcast there. Yeah, I think, yeah, we've got some interesting things going on throughout this year. And of course, at the Northern Shooting Show, we're going to be having our, our live panel debate. So those yeah. are all going to be, although you'll be able to listen to them right there and then, and actually hopefully be able to interact, that's going to be the, the plan yeah, for be, the Northern it, Shooting Show. Yeah. We're, they're going to be recorded. So if you can't be there, You'll be able to hear those in the weeks after the um, 6th and 7th of May, which is when uh, the Northern Shooting Show is. Yes, it is. Oh, sorry, I'm just looking at the calendar here, and the podcast will be out on the 9th. So you might be able to get the... No, I'm looking sorry, at the wrong calendar. The podcast for the Northern Shooting Show might... Uh, the first one will probably be out on the 18th of May. The 18th, yeah, that's what I was trying to get out. Uh, but, yeah. Remember, you can download this show on iTunes, which most of you do. SoundCloud, Stitcher. It is also on YouTube, but there's always a delay on the YouTube videos. And it's on various other platforms, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio. So there's plenty of options. Uh, tell your friends about the show. That's uh, that's key. Keep spreading the message. We've had some amazing emails oh, over have, the actually. last uh, two weeks from a number of people, a very long one, only two days ago. And uh, I would, in fact, we should probably read that I email. I think we might out. read some extracts from it. It's been amazing that the last few emails we've got from listeners have actually all been from new listeners. They normally start and by saying... starting from the beginning as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. People saying, I've, I've, I've listened to whatever it was. There'll be some podcast that pulled them in and then they said that they've started from number one. And this email we got, the, the, the chap there, he was just six in and he was just explaining how his perceptions had changed. But I think we'll save that for next time. We'll maybe read you an extract from that. The other thing that we're going to do, uh, don't forget about um, donating to the Luwairu uh, Sanctuary, which we're trying to feed and house um, a chimpanzee for a year. We're that, almost there. We're so close. Uh, and just to incentivize it a little bit more, as we said at the start, you have the opportunity, if you have donated, everyone's just going to go into a big hat and we'll pull out a name, to a chance to win a set of Smith Optics um, shooting glasses and a surefire passive ear defenders. So you might as well just have a punt. You might as well have a punt. Uh, yeah. uh, but we're so, so close now and we're really looking forward to being able to give that money over to Ivan Carter, who will uh, pass it on through his foundation um, to Lawairu. And if you haven't heard that podcast, go, 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 go and listen. 
Uh, it's just a few podcasts. We ago. had a number of people asking if they could name the chimpanzee. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if we can, but you know what? We can. I'm going to ask the question if the show can name something. Yeah, we'll see. Even we'll a see. small, a small monkey. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because they've got they've other, got other, they got other they got other primates. Yeah. Um, so it's important. It, that's the, one of the most important initiatives we've been pushing uh, in in recent weeks, and uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to finally getting out to our 660 and handing the money over to to Ivan. Yeah, awesome. Well, join us again, like Brian said, in two weeks' time. Bye.